And what's your last name, Rachel? I can't remember. <laughs> That's another topic. So uh, legally, it's Jensen. Maiden name is Kristiniak, and I can't decide which one I want to fucking go with. <laughs> Just call me Jensen. It's fine. <laughs> are you sure? <laughs> yes. If any available peeps are out there uh, in your state, right? They might be like, uh-oh, no. <laughs> Just yeah, kidding. it's not because I want a divorce. <laughs> oh, oh, Okay. Well, I could just yeah, call you, I could just I call you my, Rachel. I, name back. Well, I could call you Rachel. You could just do it however you want. I don't care. Rachel Rachel Jensen's fine. Like that's what's on all my stuff. And if they Google like Rachel Kristiniak, it's yeah, right. be more difficult. Well, and 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 I, I can't remember when acupuncture they they is it's a doctorate in acupuncture. I can't remember. You can get that. I don't have that. Okay. I have my masters. Okay. So yeah, you should get your masters in acupuncture. Okay, mm -hmm. cool. All right, here we go. Hey guys, you are listening to the Unruly Doctor Podcast a podcast about life, metaphysics, current events, politics, and anything I find interesting. Please subscribe to our channel and like this episode so that we can grow and reach a bigger audience. Enjoy the episode. Hey guys, Dr. Bain here, Unruly Doctor Podcast. We're on, I think, episode nine now, so episodes are really cranking out. I have a uh, pretty cool guest on today. I've got an acupuncturist on today. This is uh, Rachel Jensen. Rachel, why don't you uh, introduce yourself to everybody out there? Hi, everyone out there. <laughs> so um, my name is Rachel Jensen, and we were just talking about how to introduce me, and we don't necessarily have to get into that. My right. maiden name is Kristiniak. I want my maiden name back, not because <laughs> I want to not be with my husband. <laughs> yes. Okay. Because I'm reclaiming myself. Hey, man, reclaim it. <laughs> I'm like, why did I ever fucking lose it? Well, um, because the... Uh, because the government told you to. Society told me to. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, I went to school, like my traditional training is in acupuncture and Chinese medicine. Just making sure you can still hear me, right? Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah, I can hear you. We had troubles with audio for like a half an hour here. Yeah. So I went to school for Chinese medicine and that gives me a degree. It's a master. So that gives me a degree to stick needles into people and prescribe based off of Chinese medicine theory, which is like mind, body, spirit, right? So we can pretty much treat like any symptom under the sun. The shift I've taken after in, in school and definitely outside of school is more of a focus on like, how are all of those connected? Mm -hmm. How is the mind, body, and spirit connected? And I have a large passion for treating, like, you could say trauma. That gives people just an easy idea of what my passion is and what the clients who tend to come to me want to work on. Right. Um, Western diagnoses are like anxiety, depression, PTSD, things like that. So okay. what I started to find was acupuncture is awesome. Chinese medicine is awesome. And it's a tool and it doesn't tend to be always the first one I go towards. Mm. Um, like we were talking about before we press record, like I do breath work and, and ancestral connection somatics. I, there we go. I do somatics. <laughs> right. And when I learned like that was a thing, right. I'm like, Oh, okay. So yeah. Acupuncture is one. And, um, I don't lead with it anymore because the the West has done a really good job of talking about acupuncture for physical pain, mm -hmm. right? So like if you're at a party and people are like, what do you do? And you're like, I'm an acupuncturist. And you probably are familiar with this too. Like they're like, yeah, I'm a chiropractor. Oh yeah, I've had this little back pain forever. <laughs> My aunt went to see one for her neck pain, right? And right. yes, and uh, that's not necessarily why people come to me. Correct. So that's a roundabout way of um, who am I? And I practice in St. Paul, Minnesota currently. <laughs> well, yeah. And, uh, and you and I went to the same school together. So that's how, that's how we were connected on Facebook already is because we both graduated from the same, uh, I don't even know what to call our school. Cause I mean, it's, they had so many things. I think they kind of got lost in like where they really wanted to go. They went into so many mm -hmm. directions where it's like, so it's a chiropractic college, it's acupuncture, it's massage. I mean, it's got so many it's back, pre yeah. it's pre med. I mean, it's like they're yeah. just trying to get their hands and everything. Um, but I think it's interesting, like you said, that's th that is a big thing I have noticed is sometimes it's like when you go to a party and you don't really want to tell them what you do sometimes because sometimes I just want to enjoy a party and if <laughs> you know and if you have a skill that's like a party trick, like mm. it's even like in chiropractic, it's like if I'm at a party and that's like oh, you know, and now I got a line of people saying 
oh, I have, you know, can you do Adjust this right? Me. Yeah, right I'm all now. Drunk. Yeah, right now, right this minute. <laughs> and I haven't signed a consent form. Correct. Yeah, do it right here. Oh, you don't want to? Ah, oh, come on, I'm not gonna sue you if you if something bad happens. I'm like, right. yes, you will. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Those would be the last famous words on the stand. Well, for sure, right? It's like you know, well, I had a party, you know. Yeah, it's like he yeah. Said he okay. wasn't gonna sue me. Yeah, he yeah. said he wasn't gonna sue me, and here he is suing me. It's like you know, well, did you get it in writing? No, I didn't. <laughs> Um, you know, so it's like, it's, yeah, I've been in there. I've been in the same situation, but you know, and I do find it interesting, like you said, that the acupuncture is a tool because something I've said over the years is if I was ever in, like I said, I know you said, that's not the first thing you always go for now, but in terms of when I have patients asking me about acupuncture, a lot of times, unfortunately, now there are a lot of professions that have tried to take something from it and like water it down. So, you know, I'm sure that's kind of frustrating to see like, physical therapists, chiropractors, and other people kind of, you know, they just, they took it, what they wanted and they called it dry needling, you know, kind of a gross oversimplification. Yeah. So what I've noticed from that being in that arena is so many medicines overlap. And I think what has happened is like, you know, when we learned about Chinese medicine in school, they were doing everything they adjust bones right. in Chinese medicine. I mean, right. they were doing this for 4,000 years ago. Yeah. And yet we can't learn that in school. Right. So when you take an indigenous practice, and there's plenty of them all over the world, everything started you know, with the medicine. I think the West has taken things and dissected it and said, you do this and you do that. When traditionally my feel is that it was all one medicine to begin with anyways. Mm. So we find ourselves now like, you know, kind of reintegrating, I think, and reintegration can be uncomfortable, especially when there have been these lines drawn, when you bring government into the situation that says acupuncturists can do this, this, and this. Chiropractors are only allowed to do this and this and this. Massage therapists are only allowed to do this, right? Like you guys do massage, we do massage. Right. I mean, we learn it. Well, yeah, yeah. necessarily does it. Right. Um, So, yeah, like it's, my main thing is if you're going to do what's called dry needling, may I request that you inform your clients what you're doing and how it differs from Chinese medicine. Mm. If you do that and you both agree that you want to continue, then fine. Right. Right. Where I think acupuncturists get really upset is when that person, whoever is doing the dry needling, doesn't give that education, and then it's misleading as to, well, yeah, I could also treat your anxiety and your depression and your digestive issues. Right. That's why I would pause and say, I'm not sure about that. Because people come to me and they're like, well, just do that dry needling thing. Right. And then I have to educate them. And it's like, ooh, it, you know, <laughs> that's yeah. my take on it currently. Yeah, I think, you know, <clears throat> It's kind of like, too, I, th- I think, I don't really, <clears throat> on our side of it, right, in like chiropractic, there's a lot of people that do what I would call gross manipulation. Like they're just kind of like you're saying where there is a difference where it's like people are just snapping here, there, make as much noise as possible and and not really taking into account a lot of the other things of what you're actually trying to accomplish. Kind of like, you know, mm. kind of like you're saying with the needling, right, where <clears throat> I don't really care as long as it's like a separate and distinct thing, right? Like if you say, Hey man, I'm just a gross manipulator. I just move everything that I can to get some type of relief of something. No problem with that. You know, but I I think there's quite a distinct difference between that and trying to do very particular neurological chiropractic, Mm -hmm. which is what I focus more on, um, Mm -hmm. is actually trying to basically resolve neurological disorder, you know, Mm -hmm. through spine. And I do a lot of other stuff too. I do a thing called nutrition response testing for chemical problems and things like that with muscle testing and things like that. So that's something else I do entirely herbs and homeopathic remedies and, um, Mm -hmm. you know, stuff like that. And even there you can kind of see, like you said, a little bit of a bridge, you know, cause obviously Chinese herb herbology has been thousands of years in practice and, Mm -hmm. and obviously it's its own distinct art there as well. Versus like someone like me who muscle tests for nutrition stuff, I might, I, I could probably grab a Chinese herbal remedy, put it on somebody and see if that 
strengthens that weak muscle when I'm touching right. this organ or this organ or this organ. <clears throat> so there's a lot of ways where, like you're right, there is a lot of blending together. And I think where alternative health kind of lost its way, and I don't like the word alternative health because I think it's just <laughs> regular health, right? Yeah, I have the same view. Yeah, right. it's kind of bothersome to me that we're called the alternative when for actually the majority of time we've been the majority and the, and the current system was the minority. Right, um, I mean, just think about it as far as time is concerned. Our medicine has right. been around longer than um, uh, Western acute right. care. by thousands of years in some cases. Um, you know, and even homeopathy was the standard of care for far longer than, you know, modern medicine, for example. But I think where chiropractic lost it historically, and I assume acupuncture in the U S and other professions lost, you know, kind of their power in a lot of ways was when we all got licensed. It's when we gave up, Mm, we gave up our ability to practice healing things to a licensing board who then can dictate what you can and can't do, can and can't say. Insurance. Insurance, yeah, sold out to insurance companies. That's like the number one question I constantly get. Why, why don't I take insurance? Uh-huh. And it's like I could go on for an hour and a half right. about why I don't want to even touch insurance, <laughs> you right. know? It's like, and that's the most frustrating thing because three quarters of probably both our professions in some ways I would assume probably do take insurance, which can make things very challenging. Um, you know, because, you know, it really does boil everything down to, you know, say a patient's like, Hey man, I've got 24 visits with your profession on my insurance. So what they're, you've already preset how many you need for that year. You're like, okay, well, what happens if you need 30? They're pre-programmed to think that I should be better after that. Yeah. Either, either they think they need to hit that number once they do, they're done or maybe they don't even need to hit that, you know, or maybe right. they need three times that amount, you know? Yes. It can be really misleading. It's and totally misleading. Gives away the power. Yeah. Absolutely. To your insurance company. For us to make, for us as a team. Right. The, the, you know, whatever you call yourself, like the practitioner and mm-hmm. the client and or the patient. Yeah. Like it's, it's, it's a lot more fun and there's a lot more flexibility. And I find you know, part of the treatment plan is in deciding what do you want to do next? And it can really halt the healing and attending to when we have to say, oh, wait one second, I got to pull up on this computer. How many uh, do you have left this year, says this insurance company? <laughs> right. Uh, it, it takes away a lot of the power of the healing. Yeah. Well. <clears throat> and I get it. For sure. I, well, I get. I get it, I guess. I mean. I, yeah, I mean, I use, it's. You know, it's like, what do you want out of the treatments? Right. And that's a helpful conversation to have. If somebody comes in and they only want to use insurance, you know, um, then maybe they're only ready for 12 visits. True. And, um, you know, I know my, tending to my stuff personally, when I was going to see people for insurance and then I switched to cash, came from my understanding of an energy exchange. And I noticed how much more like my spirit was available and involved in my own healing when I was paying my hard earned money. Cause you care. And then I, I, I started to equate, you know, like you can just tell people who aren't there, right. The clients who aren't there and they're not invested. Right. We're so much more invested when we have an equal energy exchange, I'm giving something to you. So I'm going to pay attention Right. Versus I'm here. I didn't pay any money, so I don't have anything invested. So it makes sense that those treatments don't necessarily uh, pan out the way anyone wants them to. And I tell patients this too. It's like, I'm not trying to judge people wherever they're at financially or this and that. I always tell people, look, man, if it's unaffordable right now, you know, I get that. You know, I understand that you got to feed your family first. You got to pay your bills to keep yourself afloat first. I get that. Um, but you know, the only the, only, the times that I hit the frustration is when I know someone can afford it and they're mm-hmm. choosing not to. Mm-hmm. They're they're not valuing you enough because you're not taking insurance. Mm-hmm. You know, they say, "Oh, he doesn't take insurance. I'll just go find somebody else." You know, I'll find somebody else who does. And it's the worst way to judge who's the best person to take care of you. If that's your only determining factor of who you want to see is, do they take insurance? 
I've told pages that a million times. That should be the last thing you're thinking about. Un once again, unless you are in a, a, a serious financial strait where that has to be your only option, you know? Yeah, I hear you on that. <clears throat> and what I hear when somebody's like, well, I don't want to come. I've done it both ways. And currently I'm in a practice where we take insurance and cash. Mm -hmm. um, so if somebody comes to me and they only want to use insurance or... Yeah, for whatever reason, the price, like, um, let's say I was in a cash practice, I used to be, uh, they don't want to pay that much, and they're going to go to somebody for insurance. You know, it, um, it's really not about the money, right? There's some other block there. Right. Um, and, you know, that I just kind of chalk it up to we're not a good fit right now, kind of just what you said. Yeah. Right? That's, that's cool. I get it. I'm going to, we're going to meet each other where we are. And I'm going to meet you where you're at. You're not ready to invest in my practice. And that's okay. Right. Maybe we're not meant to be anyways. Maybe, you know, you wouldn't have gotten relief from me. Who don't, who knows? Right. Um, yeah. It's a, it's a, yeah, it's an interesting situation that, especially if you're like mine, I'm a hundred percent cash, <clears throat> something I have to deal with every day, which isn't fun. I don't really enjoy that side of practice. <laughs> mm. But here's an interesting question kind of going into the healing stuff that you do with patients. You know, say someone's coming into your office, and I'm sure this happens, right? And they don't really know what it is you do, right? They say, I heard so-and-so referred me or I saw this Facebook thing, whatever it might be. And they say, I just heard you can help me. What is, how would you describe yourself to somebody who just has no clue what any of what you do is? Yeah. Uh, you're correct. This does happen a lot. Um, and I, well, I start off by like getting more information, right? Like kind of what, what you were alluding to, like how, right. where, how did you find me? And maybe it's a referral from a friend. Um, I do a bunch, I kind of read the room and go a bunch of different ways, depending on, you know, what I feel would be helpful. Um, but just in general, you know, I say kind of what I said in the beginning, um, I used to give this Chinese medicine spiel, which I would say, I have my master's in Chinese medicine. It's a three-year degree. I went to a school in wherever that was. <laughs> Richmond, Bloomington. <laughs> Bloomington. Um, and Chinese medicine is this umbrella, if we can think about that. And then underneath that are all these different things. Right. And I talk about what those are, moxibustion, needles, uh, food therapy, herbs, cupping, blah, blah, blah. And then I kind of, I'm a very visual, like hands talky person. So I put that over here and right. I'd say, and even above that are this word, word, this word called somatics and somatics means body, right? Right. So we have Chinese medicine under that. And then I have this other branch, um, where I do things like, um, you know, guided meditations or journey, like a shamanic journey, although I'm not a shaman, haven't trained with anybody that's a shaman, but they teach it. Right. Um, and then there's ancestral connection. And I give a little bit more about kind of why people might want to use those things. And then I just sit back and I say, all right, I've been talking for a little bit. I'm curious uh, what's landing for you. And then I see what's landing for them. And then that gives me cues as to what might be more helpful to talk about next. So you would say in your practice, not everybody's going for acupuncture because you're kind of, no, no. you're giving a lot of them an option in the beginning to see where do they really want to go with it. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's tricky because where I work right now, like they pay me to do Chinese medicine, right? So it's like, <clears throat> I'll tell them I do other things. Um, and it's very easy to, so much of it lends itself to Taoism. And that's what Chinese medicine is based off of, mm -hmm. right? Guided meditation, um, food therapy, um, connecting with spirits. Like this is what they used to do. We're in a very westernized Chinese medicine state right now, like right. in the U S. Um, yeah, I forgot your question. <laughs> <It's okay. laughs> Do you well, remember? <clears throat> well, it, the way, what I was trying to get at, I, I suppose is, you know, when these, when the patient shows up wherever and they say, you know, cause I've got a lot of patients who ask me about acupuncture or Chinese medicine or, 
you know, things like that. And then after that, I kind of, I, I do want to dig into the breath work thing and some of the other stuff you're doing. Um, but just for like some of my patients who really are very curious about acupuncture, would you say that you would describe acupuncture at least in terms of what I think most people would understand it? Could you call it like a diagnostic system where it's like a system of mm. not medically diagnostics, not diagnosis necessarily, right? But would you describe it as a system of, of investigating the body, being able to find where energy is weak, right? So like these organ systems are having weak energy or, you know, chi or ki or things like that is a lot of terms some people have heard, but don't quite, I think, understand, mm. um, you know, and I think a lot of people have heard of meridians or energy channels, but once again, they don't quite understand what that really means. Mm -hmm. Would you be able to give kind of just the basics for some folks of, you know, say, Hey, I feel like this. And I was thinking about acupuncture. When I think about acupuncture, what am I thinking about? Like if I'm a patient, why should I call an acupuncture specifically in your mind? Sure. So I would start with first replacing the word acupuncture with Chinese medicine. So when you're a licensed acupuncturist, at least in the state of Minnesota, I'm pretty sure all across the U.S., you need your master's in Chinese medicine. So acupuncture is a tool, like I talked about, that umbrella uh, Chinese medicine. Okay. Needles is one thing. Gotcha. You know, there's all these other things. Gotcha. Um, so the way I would describe Chinese medicine is kind of what you were saying. It's, it definitely is a medical diagnostic tool, not Western medicine. It's Eastern medicine diagnostics. Right. Um, and we, you know, traditionally speaking, it's looking for where the imbalance is in the body. And then like you mentioned, what organs and or what meridians need, um, either. So you've got, you have, if you're looking at chi, so this is energy, right? If you're looking at a spectrum, people on YouTube can see me, right? Yeah. Uh, if you were listening, I'm just holding up my hands. <laughs> yeah. Like the line. Spotify, on they the can't. Left, you can have access, the right, you have deficiency. And then like kind of in the middle, you've got like this, a balance and or stagnation. So you're looking for these elements. And if you see an excess, you want to drain it. If you see a deficiency, you want to build it up. If there's a stagnation, you want to move it. Mm. And then we ask, you know, there's a traditional 10 questions of like, how's your sleep? How much energy you have? What does your poop look like? Right. Right. What's your, what are your emotions? And then this gives us uh, clues as to what organs are off balance. And then we kind of go from there. Right. Yeah. I think, and I, and I think that's a good way of explaining it to people. Cause I, I think some people obviously, if they, they get confused sometimes because the terminology is different and, but we're still kind of speaking about the same thing. I talk a lot about Organ weakness is obviously something mm -hmm. that I work with in terms mm -hmm. of NRT or nutrition response testing stuff I do. That's what I talk a lot about organ weakness, weakness of energy or overstimulation here or mm -hmm. things like that. It's one of the also reasons when I muscle test people, if they have piercings, I check each piercing to see if that's actually doing something to their body. Like an act, like a nose piercing? Nose and ears. Yep. Uh, or, um, for sure. Yeah. We got into this debate in, in correct. school. It actually does for sure. I mean, at least in muscle testing, like I got a perfect case. Um, when, when was that? Was that this week? Oh boy. Yeah, <clears throat> it was this week. So, so I had been muscle testing her now, this patient of mine for, oh gosh, probably once a week for the last month and, and maybe a week. So she came in, put her, put her food re supplement regimen on her, tested fine, but she started having this weird reaction recently of some kind. And I was like, okay. So we, I started going all over the different systems of her body and um, scars came up, scar tissue came up and underneath the scar tissue category, piercings and tattoos are underneath that category as causing energy imbalances. So then went through all of her body, went through surgeries, couldn't find any, couldn't find any tattoos. But so all she had was she had ears pierced. Um, and so I had her take the earrings out of her, you know, on both sides. And that was finally what made her super strong. And rebound. Oh, just taking the earrings out. Yeah, taking the earrings out. But then you also have to squirt wheat germ oil into the holes for about three, four months, which <laughs> ever, all, which people figure this stuff out, dude. People who are <laughs> smarter than me, um, as what? I tell patients, like oh, I'm telling you, man. And then here's what'll trip you out. So then she was still a little weak though, and I was like, and I saw this is I know this is this is every woman's like worst nightmare. So her wedding ring, okay, ring, rings can do it too, specifically metal rings. 
So she took the wedding ring off. And of course she got really strong after that. Like then she was fully strong. So, so it was the elements. It's all the, it's the material it's made out of, but also the location, specifically the ears for sure. The ears tend to be the worst, but also if you're wearing metal, it's conductive. So you're obviously messing with the neurology energy system that we work on, which is electrical, you know, as humans. So, but then just to, just to try to find our best kind of compromise, I said, look, this is one of the few things that I tell women that it's like, I kind of get it if you give me pushback because women don't want to take off a $10,000, $20,000 ring. <laughs> and I, I could see the look on her husband's face too. He was like bugging out. He was like, you know, <laughs> cause I'm here, I am talking about silicone rings. Right. And I'm like, she could wear a silicone one. He's uh -huh. like looking he's like, yeah. cause I probably, I'm sure he spent 20,000 on this. It was a very nice wedding ring um, yeah, or engagement ring. Oh, it was big. So I said, okay. I said, well, can we try this? I said, switch fingers. So I t had her take off one finger, had her put it on a different finger, and then she tested strong still. So even the specific finger you put it on can actually make the difference. So I know nothing about this. Um, I mean, very little. I know I've heard of it. Right. So moving it to a different finger, would that finger eventually then get deficient? Well, that's a great question. I think it probably would, honestly. I think it's because it's been lingering in that same location for a long time. That's what I, that's, that's what I think. And I, but once again, I really do truly believe the material is a huge component. I, I want, I, I would bet you if she switched to a silicone ring, it would probably cause no issue. I don't know about the earrings though. The earrings might still cause, even if they were silicone. Um, so that, that was just a little tidbit. I just thought it was interesting from what your discussion was because, you know, it's, it's in some, it's a lot of ways they, once again, they're kind of crossing streams there. Yeah, you like know. I haven't run across a medicine that doesn't in some way, shape or form look for the imbalances. We're just using different language. Right. And I think I the mean, methods. that's balanced throughout the entire world. Right. We need to water the plants, make sure they don't have too much water or else look at damp. Right. Our bodies do the same thing. For sure. And I think the biggest, I don't want to call it a battle, but it almost is like, honestly, a battle these days is the big monster that's been created in modern medicine because <laughs> these pharmaceutical drugs don't, don't work like natural things do. They, they do cause detrimental harm in a lot of ways because one, there's not thousands of years behind it. You know, two, they're taking one little component of something that is good. Like that's because a lot of drugs come from herbs. So they find, right. I, I can guarantee you. That's where the, drugs came from. Yeah. They go, they went into Chinese acupuncture, or no, Chinese medicines books and, you know, and they took out something that was for heart and they said, oh, let's analyze it. See what's in there. Ma you know. Huang is ephedra. Yep. And then they just hyper concentrate the and one. And illegal. Yeah. And that's it. can't use it in our herbs. For sure. So, you know, that's what they did. And they just, and, but see, the problem is when you take one little aspect of this and you hyper concentrate it, yeah. now you cause damage because you don't have all the balance, right? Everything's yeah, well, about you balance. you could, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, you know, what I, what I've recently started saying that makes the most sense to me is that Western medicine seems to be the best at acute care. Yeah. And when it gets when things start to get really out of balance is when we try to apply that acute care to chronic conditions. Yeah. That's when things get really icky in I, my experience. Well, and I tell people like, I'm not anti-medicine. I just, they need to start sitting in the boat that they're supposed to be sitting in, which is you're dying today. You're dying today. You're dying tomorrow. We need to do something right now. You know, like you're having a heart attack. You got to go right now. You know, right. you, you, you just got shot. You got to go right now. You're having an aneur brain aneurysm. These are right. the things where they'll save a life. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt, mm -hmm. but you don't save a life by putting someone on a drug that damp that destroys their kidneys over 20 years. And now they're mm -hmm. in kidney failure. You just killed that person. Mm -hmm. And then of course it never gets put on any statistic because, you know, kidney failure 30 years later never gets blamed on, you know, the drug mm -hmm. in question. They just say, Oh, they were. I don't know. They just, the kidneys failed. I'm like, ah, the kidney wasn't designed to fail. <laughs> the kidney was supposed to go from here to there just fine. Yeah. And you know, but that's just a personal thing, but let's dig into the breath work thing. Cause that's, I think that's yeah. an interesting thing that I haven't, I know some methods, like I know Wim Hof, mm -hmm. 
never done it because I am sensitive to cold and it sounds like a lot of work. I'd like to, <laughs> I have a philosophy. If I'm not super passionate about doing it, I know I'm not going to stick to it. So, you know, I have a patient who does Wim Hof, loves it. Um, but you know, I know that's only one, I'm sure version. So tell me, tell everybody yeah. at home about breath work. What's it for? Why would you do breath work? What's it, what's the deal? Yeah. So, um, when I think, Ooh, breath work would be really good for this. It's really great at moving stagnation in the body. Okay. So, um, you know, much the way that like exercise does like take breath work feels like a workout for the soul. Mm. Um, like cardio for the soul because it feels exactly the same. Like you're using a lot of the systems you would be using if you went for a jog, right? Right. Your heart rate goes up, uh, your blood pressure goes up. You get a lot of, uh, the same, you start sweating, yep. right? It, it's physiologically a lot, a lot is the same. Um, so, you know, the indications can be like, you feel stuck and like, what does that mean? And that can mean a lot of things. Um, you know, feeling stuck in life, you know, if we use like Western diagnoses, depression, um, even anxiety can be caused by a stuckness. There's nowhere for the energy to move. So like this frenetic energy kind of stays up here and like in the heart space and in the brain. Um, the first time I did it, I, nothing happened. And this is common with energy work. If you're not ready, I was in mm. this drum circle and there was a shaman and we're all drumming. It's my first drum circle. And like my friend brought me to it and she's like, if you breathe this way and she goes, <sighs> and she like told us how to do it really fast. She's like, you know, you might get really tingly. And like, I cried and it was yesterday and like I was shaking and I don't remember if that's all the things she said, but that's how I remember it. Definitely the like lightheadedness and like bawling. And I'm right. like, Oh, sure. Let's do that. So I tried it and I'm like, nothing's happening. This is silly. Right. So a year later, apparently I was ready mm. and I was in a smaller group right. with a breathwork facilitator and I was ready to work through some shit. And the, it, the same exact thing happened to me. Mm. So I, it was a group for um, breathwork and business. So it was small business owners, the end of the fourth quarter, and we're getting together to like plan out what we're going to do and help breathwork, use breathwork to help move the stuckness. Right, right. And I cried the entire time. <laughs> just, you know, wet. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's good stuff. And <laughs> what I was crying about was my love of music. Oh. That was a positive <laughs> cry. <laughs> and the fact that I never let uh. myself be a Britney Spears. Mm. <laughs> so there's more to that and we can talk about that more, but Yeah you know, there was something that was stuck and there was a should, there was a story in my mm. nervous system that said, like, the only way to be successful is if you're a Britney Spears, is, it was the story. And mm. through the breath work, I worked through, oh my God, no, I don't have to be Britney. I don't want to be Britney Spears. And I still want to sing and I can do it for fun. It doesn't have to mean that I make money off of it or if it's, it's a profession, but it's something that my body wanted to do. Right. That's, the stuff that you can work with, mm. with when you're doing the type of breath work that I do, which is very um, fast and it's moving and you're going to feel stuff. Right. It's not like a, when you're doing yoga and you're doing the, um, what do they call it when it sounds like an ocean? It's not pranayama. Oh boy. I wish I could tell you. Yeah. Some, <laughs> it's like in through the nose, out through the nose. Right. This is all in through the mouth, out through the mouth. Like, it's going to move some stuff. Yeah. I think, you know, there's, I think there's a large market of people in the United States that are severely lacking in letting a lot of things go that they have no idea that they're holding on to for sure. Absolutely. You know, I'd like to say I've tried breath work. I haven't. A lot of my psychological, emotional breakthroughs, um, actually were from like psilocybin mushrooms. That was, uh, <laughs> that's a story that I've never told my patients yet, but I, my patients know that I've dabbled in some psychedelics. They know that, but, uh, hopefully I can say that. Right. But, um, 
Yeah, that's yeah, actually just, we won't give details. Yeah, right. Time places. Um, one of the it's kind of it's tagging my mind right now, but one of the craziest ones was like last year ish. It was um, it was pretty nuts. Like you're talking about yoga, and it's like the weirdest thing about it was my body was contorting, and it was like finding pains. What was weird was I started having pains in like different parts of my body, and then like my body like knew how to contort to like hyper focus this point yeah. until it let go and then it would let go and I'm crying like the whole time like mm -hmm. and of course you know with psilocybin you're talking like eight hours so this is like a day this is from 7 a.m until probably like four in the afternoon mm, it's all yeah, day long. A long a longer journey that's how mine all go um <laughs> oh. I, st I strap in I, I make it, a, I make it a day. I'm like, look, I get up at six. I, ha, you know, I have a little water. I have a little meditation time and I say a little prayer because then I know probably about seven 30, it's going to be a day and I'm strapped in the phone's off. Nobody's my door is locked. I know I'm not going to eat anything until probably six. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, one of the, when you're talking about, this is what triggered the thought for me was the moment where you picked and found a strange, not strange necessarily, but an unknown energy and psychological loop that you had in your body and you don't even know about these loops. Mm -hmm. So here's an interesting one that came up in my, in that session that, that's at that session that day is kind of similar to your experience. This thought just like popped into my head. It was like a, a loop that I didn't know I was really burying. And it was really weird because in my head, all of a sudden it was like, Hey man, by the way, it was <laughs> kind of like that. It was almost like my own mind was just telling me finally, my subconscious was talking to me. It was like, Hey man, by the way, while you're contorting on the couch and you're working all this out, part of this is related to when you were a kid and your mom was constantly shaming you and was always like abusive mentally to you. And that's why you got fat when you were a kid because you were eating food in order to hold a barrier between, you know, you and your mom. And by the way, that still is applying to you even today, even though you're normal weight, because when you go out to eat, you overdo it all the time. So you should probably work through that. And then I'm like, and then, and then here I am like, you know, kaleidoscopes and my, my freaking ceilings melting. Right. And I'm contorting. <laughs> my ceiling is literally 10 million crawling like neon worms. Right. But yeah. at that, but at that time, right. It was like weird thoughts like that. And then, you know, and then a moment later, now I'm actually thinking about a particular patient and my subconscious was like, Hey man, by the way, right now you're going to actually work her energy out cause you're a healer. So, you know, mm -hmm. as part of the exchange of us giving you these gifts, you, you also have to pass the gifts on. Mm -hmm. And so then I, and then I, so then I don't know. Maybe I'm going off a tangent here, but it, for it's some reason tangent. it felt related. But so then like it's totally related. Yeah. I can like, riff off of that. And, and what was weird was, well, not weird, but I, I understand it more now. But part of your healing is a give back. If they you will I, I, personal experience, but your healing will not continue deeper and deeper unless you give it to somebody else or you pass it on. That's just something I'm realizing is that the more I pass on the knowledge and healing to others, the deeper I'm allowed to go. Very much like you say, when you're ready, what, I've also found that there's layers that they won't let you go to unless you've passed on the knowledge that's part of the healing process. Mm -hmm. So in that same session, because they were giving so much, they were like, okay, we got to take something and you got to work through somebody else's pain so I had this patient who had this weird like throat thing. I couldn't even tell you. She had this weird swallowing problem. Um, and then all of a sudden, like my own consciousness is like, okay, now you're going to have to help energy heal this distance, energy heal this person. I'm like, I don't know how to do that. And it's like, ah, it's going to happen right now. And then like my throat's <laughs> like going like closing in. Like yeah. I felt the, the squeeze and now I'm crying. And what was really weird I was crying exactly like she did. She had this very particular style of crying. It was, and I can't even do it anymore because I can't remember what it was. It was all so blurred, but she had like this hitch in her cry. I was like, ha, 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 ha like this. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like literally doing it exactly like naturally until this zone kind of cleared out. So it's interesting because I think breath work is probably another way to tap into this, a similar system because the hyperventilating or the constant breathing can can open up psychedelic channels in your mind 
you know, I know that can release DMT and can release other things. Mm -hmm. So do you think that's a big part of the breath work thing? Do you think it's actually activating, you know, releasing DMT in the brain or, you know, what do you, what do you think is the big activator? So to me, this is all about altered states of consciousness. Right. And you can get there several ways. Psychedelics, um, not just psilocybin, but, you know, most of them. Um, breath work is one way. Um, like kundalini yoga, I've heard can do it. Right. Uh, really intense exercise, fasting. Um, yeah, so that's, that's really what they're doing and they do them in a different way like psychedelics it you know is easier in a way to me because you ingest something and then you just sit there and ride the roller coaster right. whereas in breath work you have to actively be doing something and sometimes right. it can be more difficult to go through the resistance because you have to keep physically doing something um like with all the other stuff you know intense exercise like if you're not up to doing that you're not going to get into that ultra state of consciousness whereas when right. you ingest something it just happens for you like there's going to be resistance but there's nothing you can do about it <laughs> <laughs> right oh you know, yeah i mean there, there is right you can well, breathe through it and such but you're yeah. on the roller coaster, oh no yeah that's so. that's you're talking i mean that's eight hours when i when i'm in i'm like strapped yeah like you said it's a roller coat there is no pause which I think is part well, of it's the- it's like a wave, right? <laughs> well, like, it yeah. comes and goes. Well, it's the good and bad part of that version of trying to heal those emotional traumas is I think yeah, some people, they don't want to go there, right? So some people are like, you know, I'm sure they do this in breath work where they're trying to pull the cord right at the moment of, you know, you got to go past, right? So mm -hmm. like psychedelics or mushrooms, things like that, they, they, you don't, you're not allowed to not go past the threshold. The thresholds come and you're going like, you know, just like when you're on the ride, you can't, you can't stop the ride at this point. It's right about to go. Um, well, there's like a skill, you know, you know right. when, where you, you learn to widen your nervous system. So it can hold those roller coasters. Right. Right. So like if you go do some ayahuasca journey in Brazil, yeah. and you've never done it right and you don't know the people you're with and you have no context right as to like or a container as to how to hold an experience like this you're going to be blasted off into space likely mm -hmm. or it's like popping lsd and going to a rave and you've never done it before right mm -hmm. that's going to be very different and right you know you do have some control right you can tell the medicine to slow down just like you can tell spirits or universe like hey this is moving too fast right and you need to have that skill in order to do it, right? Right. So going into any type of healing ceremony or an altered state of consciousness, when your nervous system is widened enough, you can see the roller coaster coming and say like, okay, uh, this is too fast. And at least this has been my experience. This is too fast. I need you to slow the fuck down because I'm not going to be able to do anything here. <laughs> and, or you're in a space, you're like, okay, I'm ready to go deeper. I can take this amount of energy that's coming at me. And here we go. Right. Those have been my experiences. Yeah. I think and breath works. To sit with the uncomfortable is the skill. Yeah. I think when I think breath works, one of those things that it's one of the next ones to explore Ayahuasca is definitely on my list for sure. I've read several books on it. One of them where it was a medical doctor who became a shaman. And mm. um, his, his book's really interesting. I'll, I'll see if I can find it for you. It's something about the, something, I can't remember the name. It's something with a river. I can't remember the name of it. It's got a little snake on the front. Mm. Um, but that, that's an interesting book, talking about that kind of stuff and the breakthroughs. And I think, yeah, I think you're right. Breath work is a huge eye opener for a lot of people, it will give them an ability to start opening up some channels. And I think more people slowly, you know, slowly are becoming more open to some of these, I would probably definitely argue rediscoveries. A lot of this is all just rediscoveries oh, of totally. lost knowledge. This stuff was known so long ago before, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands, you know, people were doing giant circles and chanting around fires and holding hands and, you know, utilizing all are. this. Yeah, still are, just not- Lost in the West. Correct, in right. In modern cultures. Yeah, and, and <clears throat> I think part of it though too, I mean, everybody always talks about this we're conspiracy theorist person, but yeah, he, my thing is, 
I think a lot of this has been buried on purpose because I think if everybody was truly was fully open spiritually, energetically and stuff, we'd all kind of sit around. We'd realize how ridiculous the system of power has become and we'd probably coalesce together to shut it all down. I, that's just a, that's just a me thing. That's, you know, but you know, when well, people, I mean, when you think about the drug war, I mean, right. things were suppressed. Oh, there's been tons of suppression and knowledge is a great thing to suppress. It's been used Mm -hmm. multiple times in history that when you, when you suppress knowledge, you suppress power because, Mm -hmm. you know, with knowledge comes power and other things, right? So, you know, if we have a power to create and heal people through energy and things like that, which I do believe you can, I think once again, though, the methods have been kind of lost over time, you know, for once again, typically people in power trying to bury that knowledge and eliminate it. We're talking about colonization. Yeah, right. I mean, it's 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 everything, right? I mean, it's anybody any time there's ever been one person who says, "I want to have power over these people." If I can take away their technology and their knowledge over time, they become very easy to control because mm-hmm. we can replace their knowledge with whatever we want in newer generations. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and but there's like the. You know, like there is a small rediscovery, s- slowly building of, you know, because people are really realizing they've lost something. They just don't know quite what it is. Like they're depressed all the time. They've got all these health issues all the time. They're not happy. There's just a lot of things going on. And I think a lot of it's a lost connection to the, the channels and energies and things that we're talking about. Yeah. You know, um, so that also leads me to that. The other part of it now I can't remember how to pronounce the, the, your your third method, the ancient something. I can't remember. Ancestral connection. Ancestral connection. So what yeah. is that? That's something I haven't probably heard out about before. Yeah. So that's um, really a lot of what we've been talking about is we've lost in the West, in the modern world, and through colonization, mm. indigenous cultures have – have lost their medicine and you know again when we go and look far back um people living on this planet all had their traditional ways and so many of them um most all of them had a connection to the dead okay they were wondering about the stars right they were hypothesizing about it um there was a different relationship with grief um, a different relationship with dying and with spirits and people who passed on. Mm. So fast forward to now, January, 2022, our relationship with the spirits pretty much, it's like um, Halloween. Right. Is really much it and horror movies. Right. Um, it's really been, um, oh, what's that word? Um, fantasized, like, commercialize it's like the movie um it's like that disney movie or pixar movie um oh man coco coco oh yeah it's been made into coco yeah so whatever that word i'm looking for is but yes that's a great example right um which is actually a kind of i mean i don't know too much about that culture but it, it seemed pretty spot on right right yeah and um so we've lost this way of communication with spirits. Right. Um, Our funerals are, you know, awake the funeral and then what the fuck is wrong with you? Get on with your life. You should stop crying now. Right. Um, So this, this ancestral connection thing is really, you know, people, God, it's just so vast. It's always hard to like pinpoint where I want to talk about it. Is it a technique system? Is it, Say that again. Is it a method? Is it a method of technique yeah. of guiding? Well, I mean, or? so just a blanket, like it's, it's, it's learning to reconnect to our ancestors, the ones that have passed on, right? So if physics, we know that energy doesn't just go away, it transforms, mm-hmm. right? So they're not embodied anymore. They are the non-bodied, People, plants, elements, animals, stuff like that. Um, and what I work mostly with are the blood ancestors. So, you know, people you would think about grandma, grandpa, you know, down thousands of thousands of years. And what you're doing 
is when you follow the method that I've learned is you're, you're looking to heal up the wound Mm. and you start with, so you've got, you have your dad's mom and dad and your mom's mom and dad, and you work with those lines. Right. And you're, you're basically working to find a healed ancestor on both sides. So this is where the shamanic journey kind of comes into play. Mm. You're, you're, you're journeying to find a healed ancestor in all four lines. And there's millions of ways to do this. This is just the one way I've been taught. Right. And then you, you make a connection with them and, and, and reconnect. And then through that, you start to like, we all need each other. The dead needs us. We need the dead to facilitate this process of healing. And much like what we've been talking about, so much of our culture has been severed. Right. And the dark law comes into play here, or like core beliefs. Mm. Uh, that's a, a term, in, it's like psych 101, core beliefs of like, I am stupid. I'm not worthy. I'm ugly. Mm. I will never mount to anything. These are core beliefs. And that's one way you can start working with your ancestors is that's likely not something that you have taken on during this lifetime. Right. This is epigenetics also. Right. So that likely came from one of these lines. And so we work to find out where might that have come from? And then we start the process of tending to it. Hmm. Um, And you know, it's working when you start noticing present moment shifts in your relationships and the way you feel and your, your connection to that core belief. That's interesting. Um, you know, it's kind of, cause I've done a lot of metaphysical exploration, listening, learning, exploring. That sounds a lot now once again, and I don't prescribe to this religion. Okay. It's not, not for me, but that's, that sounds a lot like the Scientologist's description of what they call an engram. Have you ever heard of that? Oh, mm-mm. yeah. So part of Scientology is you, you ever seen like the vit, the movies that are vit, that stuff that make fun of Scientology or whatever. And then one of the first things they do is they pull you into a room where they do what's called auditing. Have you heard yes. of that? So right. And there's a little machine, right. Where you hold the uh, rods or whatever. And you know, it, it moves ticks. Right. What they're actually doing in that, which is because this is the one reason that people will say, well, why, do, why does anybody, why do any of these people get, get pulled into Scientology? I'm like, because there's some things that are real that they have discovered. That it's the same knowledge that you're talking about. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a reason people get sucked into that because there is some actual truth in some of the stuff that they figured out. And this is probably why it's the first thing they have you do because it, it, that's actually legit. Where like with their machine, they start asking you questions and they do something very similar to what you're talking about where they're actually going back and they're asking you a series of questions. And when they're ticking on something that has truth to it, that's when the meter will change. So they're actually going back, they're going back into previous lifetimes. They're going back into, were you an alien on another planet somewhere? And what, you know, what traumas did you experience and, you know, energy things and whatever in order to resolve those things. Mm -hmm. So not, I'm not promoting Scientology. Anybody who watches this, don't become a Scientologist. Okay. Don't do it. (laughs) It's all about money in the long run for those guys, but they did discover some similar knowledge, right? Just a different, probably I would argue a more mechanistic way of, of discovering similar knowledge. Um, or like, for example, I talk, I've talked a lot to my patients about past life regression therapy and where you can actually be hypnotized to remember some of your past lives or past deaths and trying to resolve those traumas. So I think that it really correlates interestingly with the conversation earlier we had about how knowledge has been discovered multiple times and has different ways of trying to get to the same answer because, you know, there's three right there that are all trying to connect on, into the same channel of previous lifetimes, other family members, soul groups, right? So maybe your grandma now was your whatever in another life. Maybe she was your mom in another lifetime and now you're reconnecting to a trauma that happened between the two of you to heal that burden. You know, a lot of interesting channels all trying to access the same problem. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Yeah, it could be. I don't know much about the past life regression therapy or Scientology. What I have found is that there there can be a thread of of similarity, um, and that's how a lot of those like Scientology I think takes off. Like like you mentioned, right? Um, partial truths. Sure. Yeah, partial. If they they did actually have some legitimate discoveries, and then there's about three quarters that were just made up. 
Mm. but <laughs> you know, to make money, right. The typical, the typical conundrum with most things these days. Mm. Um, but you know, like in terms of past life regression, there's a lot of what, a lot of what you're talking about. It has, there's a lot of ways that those could reconnect. I'll, I'll have to send you some information on past life regression. That it's almost something I, I might learn at some point to do. It's, I don't know. It's a debate. How many things do I need to learn? Uh, I know. You know, it's like, how many freaking methods do I have to learn? I'm like, you know what I mean? I already got two good ones. I, yeah. I rock both of those things. I, I'm going to continue getting better at both of those. It's like, how many do you really need? Mm. You know, it's like, I'm trying not to just keep going because I could always keep going. Yeah. Like there's a, there's a thin line between always being a student and where the ego is driving the knowledge. Mm. Right. It's like, I want to help people, but you know, it's like at the same time, if I keep spreading yourself, you know, more, more thin, you know, at some point I, it's like, I got to tell myself, it's like, Hey man, you know, you got enough things going on, learn some things out of curiosity, but it's like, if someone really has a passion for that one thing and they want to just crush that one thing, it's probably like, you should probably send them to that person. If that's like all they, you know what I mean? If that's like their main love is doing that thing. You know, it's like, I might at some point still, but we'll see. Mm -hmm. There's actually some, there's a practitioner down here somewhere who's very high level in that. So I'm, I'm thinking about paying them to, to do a session because oh, yeah. those, well, there's, those sessions are long. I think they said they're about four hours to six hour sessions. Oh, wow. So you pay a lot of money, but it's all day. You're the one person that whole day. Mm. So I, I think I'm going to do that as a podcast episode. Yeah, that sounds very interesting. <laughs> So I think we dug into everything. So what's one of the big things you want to leave everybody with? Give me something you want everybody to leave with today and, mm. you know. The word fluidity comes into mm. mind. Okay. Um, and this idea that we don't allow ourselves or other humans to be flexible. Right. It's like we're... Our nervous systems have been taught to be comfortable in black and white, mm -hmm. and we are not necessarily comfortable in the gray. Right. Um, so yeah, just a feeling of like what's coming through is maybe, you know, if that's new to you, being in the gray, like honor that it's probably because it doesn't feel safe. Mm. And yet so much of life is in the gray and when we give ourselves permission to be fluid right kind of go more to the white go to the black be in the middle say i don't fucking know <laughs> we give other people permission to do the same right and also how can people find you because you've got a podcast you just started i'm sure yeah. you've got several social media outlets so where can so people really. find you um, okay i'm not really on facebook a whole lot more it's yeah i'm instagram is is where i hang out most okay. so that is uh rachel k healing arts hmm. with an underscore after each word okay um and then my podcast is currently on spotify and anchor and that is called the curiosity sweet and what's with rachel your christiniak and what would you say the, <laughs> and what would you say the podcast as just a general one, one liner sentence, what would you say the, the main topic of it is? What's the main? A one liner is, I don't know yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I could feel and that. that. Was, that's the only way I could push record is to not have a plan. And yeah. just kind of let it show itself to me yeah. uh, to see what's up. But it's, it's a lot of kind of what we've been talking about. Um, you know, we talk about grief and the birth death cycle and permission slips and how it's okay to swear. It's okay to have sex and we can talk about it. Oh, really? We talk about relationships. <laughs> yeah. Just like kind of taking yeah. that, this box that we, especially white people put them in mm. themselves in. Right. And learning to be vulnerable so we can like touch the edges of that box and see like what's outside of the box, mm. you know, and, and that's all for me. That's been so much in learning being to being vulnerable. Yeah. Slowly. <laughs> like I'm not looking to jump into 
a sea full of sharks. Yeah. I might, you know, dip my toe in a little bit. So that feels, <laughs> I'm not looking to have a vulnerability hangover. <laughs> Well, you know, the more, the more you release your, uh, your person into social media world, the more you, you're going to get exposed to the old sharks. You do. You know, right? I've so had, again, you do it I get, slow. hopefully you can do it slow. I get chomped every month. So I, I, uh, I yeah. let them take their jabs. It's all right. Yeah. I can live. It's part of the journey. Yeah. It's not everybody's woken up to, you know, being higher consciousness quite yet, but peace at a time try to wake people up, get their consciousness raised, raised up a bit. And, you know, these are good methods to do it. Podcasts and videos and. And recognizing you know. that it's not everybody's thing. Yeah. You know, not it's everybody not loves everybody's it. truth. Yeah. Not everybody loves it. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Yeah. I, I know what that feels like. Yeah. Okay, guys. So that was episode, what, nine of the Unruly Doctor podcast. So you can remember if you're listening on Spotify, thank you for listening. If you haven't, this is your first time, please hit the subscribe button. We also post this on YouTube and Facebook on Springback Chiropractic. So thanks, guys.